Hello, everyone. This is Doug Schnitzbahn, the editor of The Weekly, the new digital magazine from Outdoor Retailer that we are publishing to uh, keep you informed, give you resources, and make a place to share your voices during this crisis. Uh, today, our guest we're really excited about is Dirk Sorensen, who is the executive director of sports and industry analysis for the NPD Group. And he's going to be talking about research. He told me that people were a little bored by numbers. I'm kind of excited by numbers, but uh, he's going to be talking about <laughs> the numbers, uh, research they have during this crisis, as well as the analysis of that, which is probably more interesting. Uh, before I introduce him and we get going, a few little things to go through here. Uh, if you're having trouble uh, receiving audio during this broadcast, please select the question mark in the upper corner of the webcast interface and then select test my stream now. Uh, you can always disconnect and rejoin if you're experiencing issues. Um, that's no problem. Uh, if you have a question, which I would love for you to ask during this, you can submit it in the box labeled, ask a question. Uh, questions are sent directly to the moderator and they're not shown publicly. So you don't have to worry about your name being in there or anything like that. We'll try to get to as many questions as we can during the webinar. Uh, this is being recorded and you can access the on-demand file on the Outdoor Retailer website. I'm going to put up a little slide here, some questions about MPD. Actually, we'll come back to it. Yeah. Here we are. Here I am with Dirk Sorensen. Uh, Dirk, you're the Executive Director, Industry Analysis in the MPD Group Sports, and you look at bicycling, outdoor, and team sports equipment categories. Uh, yep. You travel extensively to provide insight uh, on the U.S. sports landscape, cycling and outdoor equipment, manufacturing and retail communities. Uh, you have a lot of data on, not on product management. You used to work in the kayak industry. Yep. Uh, so why don't you tell us a little more, more about who you are and what you do? Sure. So I've been here. Yeah, absolutely. So I've been in first, thank you very much for, you know, inviting me to talk about kind of what we've been seeing over the last, uh, you know, nine, 10 weeks. Uh, it's been quite eye opening uh, about what consumers really care about. My background is actually I've been in product management, marketing roles and outdoor equipment uh, whether that's cycling or in the kayak space, as you mentioned, for a, a long time, probably way longer than I want to admit to. I've been here at MPD Group for about four or five years, four and a half years now, um, and really focused in on the trends that uh, we're seeing and helping manufacturing retail clients understand what's happening in the retail landscape around team sports equipment, cycling equipment, and outdoor equipment primarily. I do kind of keep my finger on the pulse of what's happening in footwear and apparel also, but really specific, not in the general kind of fashion sense, but more in, you know, what, what you would see at an OR trade show, walking the floor, that kind of thing. So um, my interest area is really kind of about, you know, how do we use this information to kind of fuel our success moving forward? and. Um, I found a, a great amount of support and success in being able to use data uh, when I was on the manufacturing side to make in, in kind of some informed decisions about future, future choices and that kind of thing. So really excited to talk with you all about what we've been seeing over the last several weeks uh, as um, we've all transitioned from our offices and live discussions to uh, forums like this one. So very much uh, appreciate you taking the time to reach out to me and the MPD group to have uh, have us talk with you. Absolutely. Well, we actually got a question right away, kind of on the housekeeping there. Someone wanted to know if they will receive copies of the slides or if they should be furiously taking notes. You might want to take <laughs> notes. <laughs> You might want to take notes, but as I, as I said before, this is all going to be recorded and posted uh, after our discussion. So if there's anything you want to find, you can find it on that recording later. Yeah, uh, and, and un, unlike a lot of probably the NPD group types of things that we do where we have lots of decks, um, you know, Doug and I are really going to have more of a conversation today. Um, in terms of specific numbers and outreach, you know, you can always reach out to any of us at the NPD group and, and we'll, you know, we'll endeavor to help you the best we can. 
Um, so, so feel free to do that. And, and I know as housekeeping at the end of this conversation, uh, we'll have some emails up for, for the audience in order to reach out to us and, and contact the appropriate people at NPD if you need that kind of help. And I'm sure, Doug, you've got um, a similar way of being contacted for information as well. Absolutely. Um, so before we get going into the deeper questions, maybe we can just talk first a little bit about that uh, the point I came upon, which is, you know, numbers. You guys mm -hmm. collect numbers, but really the more important thing is, is looking deeper into these numbers and what they mean in context. Right. You speak right. A bit yeah, I mean, you know, uh, NPD collects millions of data points uh, monthly, even weekly. Um, and really, it's about the work that we do to kind of structure it in usable ways. Right. So what we're doing is at NPD, we collect data from, you know, a number of sources. I think our claim to fame more than anything is. Um, working with retailers to gain their point of sales information and really understand what's happening through that um, through that world, right? So um, I think that's pretty exciting um, to uh, you know be able to kind of see that moment of truth at the the cash register as to what people are really buying. We also uh, have two you know two other services that MPD does. Uh, utilized to understand consumer behavior. One is, you know, kind of traditional consumer surveys. And then another is something called checkout tracking, which um, really is the ability to gain receipts from consumers. And the power of that is to be able to see the longitudinal value uh, of a consumer as they navigate the retail landscape. So we'll be tapping into all of that kind of information as we have a conversation today. Um, big part of what we do is really understanding uh, this copious amount of information and trying to make it mean something, derive some insights from it. So when I said to you that I think people get a little bit bored with numbers, um, I am really adept at kind of overwhelming people with numbers. Uh, at the end of the day, I think what people want to know is what does it all mean? And so I'm uh, really excited to talk with you about kind of what we think it means um, as we've kind of watched the COVID-19 crisis uh, envelop retail and, and really transform how consumers engage with and purchase outdoor equipment items. Yeah, and maybe one more thing before we get deeper into that. And if sure. someone's watching, how do they know that we can trust your numbers, NPD? What's the, you know, what can we guarantee you <laughs> that you guys have good numbers and know what you're doing? <laughs> Yeah, so we, I think, you know, we've been the, the data of record for the outdoor equipment industry for a heck of a long time. Um, we work, uh, you know, with major trade associations and they trust what we do. We track about 20 industries and work with the largest, world's largest retailers um, and, you know, many of the biggest manufacturers that uh, are in our industry, and they all kind of look to us as a standard bearer for what's happening in the retail industry. Um, we take an inordinate amount of time making sure that how we project our data, what we represent the universes to be, um, is as close to accurate as we can get it. So. Um, we've been doing this for a heck of a long time. So um, NPD is really one of the leading market research firms doing this in the United States and, and really kind of the standout firm in the world of kind of consumer uh, product that is not related to, you know, food and that sort of stuff. So we really have our finger on the pulse. Sure. And someone here is just asking, do you track any direct to consumer sales? Um, not through our point of sale at present. Um, we do have methods of understanding it more generally, but we don't have that directly right now for many of the categories we'll talk about today. Great. Thanks. So let's get into some of the questions that, uh, you know, we asked you in the weekly that came out sure. yesterday. Sure. Uh, and the first one of those is how has COVID-19 and the shutdown of brick and mortar stores impacted sales for the outdoor equipment industry? Pretty broad question. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, you know to be to be blunt, I think it's been pretty de darn devastating in the core camping and accessories categories through the kind of seven to eight weeks of between basically March fifteenth to 
uh, May 2nd, which is kind of the, the heart of the COVID crisis, we saw those core categories and camping accessories and camp categories decline 17%. Uh, active apparel and uh, athletic footwear, um, the impact was far more significant. We saw in that same time period declines well over 50% in those two categories. So um, really kind of uh, earth shattering numbers that we're all trying to navigate through. Um, really what we've seen though is, you know, while um, in general, we've seen this kind of aggregated decline. There are some standout stories that are really, really positive ones. Uh, for example, health and fitness has is is grown over that period of time about 175%. So items like cardio machines, stationary bikes, weight equipment, those types of things that people are buying to be healthy at home have flown off the shelves. Bicycles is, is another example where we saw the growth of bicycles in the cycling industry do really, really well. Um, so there are real positive pockets of where retailers have managed to succeed in the teeth of this thing. Absolutely, and fitness you said it was a big one. One that you mentioned in the story that's interesting, I think, is that coolers, something you might think is up, are actually down, right? So there's some surprises there, right? Yeah, there are, you know, so so when I started looking at the data, one of the, in, you know, you, one of the things I do is when I look at the data, I relate it to my own personal experience. And I was like, gosh, you know, emergency equipment, you know, things like portable power and freeze dried food, those have to be doing really, really well. And in fact, over those first couple of weeks of the crisis, we saw those categories do exceptionally well. And I thought for for certain um, and it might be because I used to live in the Southeast that people would be buying coolers because they would be afraid that, you know, the power was going to go out. And in fact, that's kind of not what happened, right? So um, really, I think what consumers did was they thought smartly about what the dimensions of this crisis were going to be, right? That they were going to have a refrigerator three to four feet away from them. You know, that's kind of my new living is being able to just walk over from my new office and go get food five feet away. And so they really behaved appropriately around cooler sales. So cooler sales, in fact, are kind of a little bit down. I, I, uh, I think I mentioned in the piece it's down around 40%, you know, as we've gone through this. Now we're seeing some signs of recovery in the last couple of measured periods. But it makes sense because people don't have anywhere to go right now. And coolers enable that, you know, movement of your food from your home out into an outdoor experience, whether that's a beach or a park or going camping. And until we've, you know, now we're starting to see a revision of that behavior. And now cooler sales are starting to come back up. The second thing I would say about coolers is um, the rotor molded items. I used to come from the kayak industry. And one of our challenges was, um, you build something that's indestructible. So that replacement cycle is really, really long. And we are starting to see detections or, or indications of this, those challenges with coolers even last year that consumers probably had one in their garage and didn't need to replace it. So I think those two things kind of coming together, um, nowhere to go, and you know, basically there's a great cooler in your garage have kind of kept kept sales depressed. Now, what we're seeing is a, a kind of a slow rebound back to normal in a number of our categories. Many of the categories uh, that we track, like recreational tents, um, you know, even kayaks, those types of things we're seeing actually perform better than they were at this time last year. Sure. Um, you know, fitness, I think, is a pretty obvious one that was going to do well during this time period. Were there any yeah. positive positive surprises that you saw that were strange or odd or took you a little while to figure out? Oh, like head scratchers and the positive yeah. side. Um, I'll tell you one that uh, I was talking to a coworker about yesterday and we were both like, wow, what a reversal is hammocks. So um, anybody that's visited an outdoor retailer from 2015 forward saw the kind of pronounced, uh, you know, increase in that category in 2015, 2016, and then um, a sharp declination in that category. Hammocks are actually up 55% during this crisis. Now, it's not like a wow. I mean, it's pretty easy to connect the dots that 
you know, people are trying to kind of have a backyard and venture and, and have this kind of uh, equipment, whether that's grills or hammocks for their backyard use, as well as enabling camping and that sort of stuff. But to see a category that was kind of um, challenged pre-COVID um, get a real bump because people are staying at home is, is really kind of an interesting moment in kind of what we track at retail and kind of refreshing too, you know, that people have taken the time and energy and money to see out items to enable themselves to breathe some fresh air um, is heartwarming for me, right? Like it's, it, it gives me this kind of uh, happiness that it's, it's probably, um, something in our consumer behavior and our behavior as human beings to want to get outside and breathe fresh air and not get locked down. Um, so, you know, pretty exciting moment when you really kind of think about what's in behind the number of hammock sales. Absolutely. Um, and I guess one other thing to look at these numbers now is there's so much uncertainty, right? You know, things are affected by staying at home. Things are going to change when we go out. We might be yeah. back at home again. Uh, you know. is there <laughs> Right. Is there any way you can can address that when you're you're looking at these research? These research? In, ter in terms of predictive behaviors, we really can't, right? Because I think we're all beholden, whether we're manufacturers or retailers, to uh, a lot of situations or or elements that are largely out of our control. Um, you know, this morning I was reading the unemployment. You know, numbers are at about forty million, or one in four working Americans are now, you know, drawing an unemployment check. That's a pretty stark number. And one that we have to kind of assume is going to tamp down retail behavior and consumption behavior, right? Um, and nobody can really predict when that's going to get back to any sort of normal or no, any sort of certainty. Um, store reopenings, which we're watching very, very carefully right now, um, are going to be another kind of indicator of success, right? So, what we found very early on when you look at those footwear and apparel numbers is uh, they correspond to retail store closings, right? Like brick and mortar. And one of the, you know, when you walk the aisles of the, re you know, a physical outdoor retailer, you, know, you always hear a buzz about uh, brick and mortar being replaced. Um, it's so clear now having eight weeks, seven weeks where we didn't have brick and mortar open, which categories really, really thrive well in a brick and mortar scenario, right? People do want to touch um, the item that they're about to buy when it comes to apparel. They do want to try on footwear. Um, you know, even in the cycling space, we saw cycling grow pretty significantly when it came to the core items like bikes, but items that required trying on, whether that was a glove or a, a footwear or even a helmet, really were struggling, you know, in this time of, of retail shutdown. Because I think people really do have this innate kind of desire to try things on. So, you know, those are kind of, as we're moving out of this, those are two of the things I'm going to be looking at is actually probably four things. One, when are health and fitness clubs going to reopen? Two, what does the unemployment rate look like? Three, can people travel using aircraft well? And, and kind of four, what, a, what does the retail landscape look like? So I'm constantly, almost every day, obsessively looking at those four measures way more than I am at this point at the COVID-specific measures, just to kind of understand what's going to happen at retail. Absolutely. We have a ton of uh, uh, listener questions here, a ton of listener questions. So let's look at some Great. of those. Uh, there was one early on. They just wanted to know what specifically are your methods for tracking the direct-to-consumer, which you talked a little about, about earlier. Yeah, we're emerging that right now. I think our, you know, we have kind of two methods that we, we rely on that are outside of POS. We do a fair amount of consumer research where we – actually ask consumers directly what their behaviors are, where they're buying and how they're buying things. So we collect a lot of data that way. Um, and it's fairly um, insightful when it comes to 
categories like apparel and footwear where people purchase those things pretty often, we can use that method rel relatively reliably to get a pulse on what's happening at direct to consumer. The second is checkout tracking. So checkout tracking, as I mentioned earlier, is this method where we have a panel of consumers that give us their receipts directly. And we use, you know, technology, we'll just use that, the big phrase, right, to scan through all of those receipts and make sense of them. And because those receipts are gained from the consumer, we can see if they purchase something from a direct consumer outlet and so forth. So those two elements are something that we track really, you know, can use pretty reliably in the purchase of fast turning items or items that people buy more than once or twice a year. Um, where POS becomes really powerful, uh, and sorry to get nerdish on people, is um, where the item is purchased a little bit more infrequently, and that becomes a really powerful cornerstone of point of sales tracking. Uh, and like I said before, point of sales tracking is so awesome because it really is the moment of truth, right? There's no challenges with recollection or data collection. Or, or less challenges, I should say, because we're getting that information right from the retailer. Thank you. That's, and I, I think that answers this person's question. Let's hope so. Uh, yeah. Well, and, and, and email us if you've got more like that, right? Like we, we, we can totally nerd out on that kind of stuff all day long here in the office in our one on one scenario for sure. Um, some other people wanted to know, and I know the answer to this, maybe say, you know, is the data exclusively USA or does it include Canada, Mexico, and others? And wanted to know about uh, whether they're the declining global figures too in your in your research. But yeah, we're the the context of this conversation is really US based. NPD does track uh, sales globally, but um, the information that I'm really talking about and feel comfortable with is US based. And then we have two questions here that kind of work together. And they, people want to know whether the, the health and home fitness trends, are they going to stay strong uh, as well as bicycling? Or are they going to mm -hmm. stay strong or do you think they're going to start to drop off uh, post-COVID? Um, it's hard to say. You know, um, consumers are, um, we're learning a lot about the kind of the, the dimensions of how quickly people can change their behaviors. Um, in many ways, I think what we have right now with cycling, health and fitness trends at home is a footprint for success, right? Like we've been given an opportunity to engage with consumers because they're active right now doing these things. Um, I think it's up to manufacturing and retail to figure out those short-term methods to assure longer-term success. So in the case of health and fitness, I think we have to back ourselves up and ask ourselves this question, which is why do people like to go to the gym, right? And one of those reasons is for the personal connection. And if we can figure out how to um, address that need and let people work out at home or engage people working out at home more, um, you know, I think that's those are the types of recipes of success that we need to look for as we move out of the crisis. Um, you know, is there a strong likelihood that people can just move back to their old behaviors? Absolutely there are, right? But I think if we address, you know, why do people do what they did um, and make sure that we're augmenting our retail behaviors, our manufacturing behaviors, our marketing messages to address those, those other needs, um, then we stand a chance at creating kind of permanent change. Um, but it, who's to know, right? Um, with cycling, again, you know, what we've seen in the cycling space is an absolute surge in the, the sale of kids' bikes, which is, you know, being driven from a need of having kids at home and, and parents having to reinvent recess. We're, but, we're, you know, at the same time, we're seeing the sale of transit fitness style bicycles and bicycles that are basically under $1,000 or even in that $500 price band do exceptionally well. So we have new consumers invited into the behavior, in, into the activity. Now it's really up to us to kind of keep them in and, and take the active steps as a community of manufacturers and retailers to keep, and even nonprofits, to keep people engaged in this, this kind of temporary change in their behaviors. 
Now, what do we have at our back? Health and fitness equipment and bicycles aren't, you know, $20 investments. So my hope is, is that people have put money into this activities and they're going to want to continue them. And so um, there is going to, I think, for consumers are going to want to look for opportunities to continue this behavior. Absolutely. We're throwing a pretty wide net, right? You think you're going to keep some of these people, at least all these new people? Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you, know, you never know, right? Like, um, you guys have been, we've all been around this industry that we love a, a heck of a long time. And um, we've, we've benefited from um, winning when we should have never won. And we've, we've squandered opportunities when we shouldn't have, right? So I think, this is just one of those moments where we shouldn't be wasting wasting the upside of the crisis, right? Like we should be really thinking about this footprint that we've created, whether that's in health and fitness or in this kind of backyard adventure moment or in, in cycling, right? And reinventing recess to keep people engaged. Absolutely. Um, a little nuts and bolts question here that I don't think we got to at the beginning. Someone wanted to know what time periods you're comparing it is it the last nine weeks compared to the same nine yeah. weeks a year ago, or is this year to date? Yeah, that's great. Great nuts and bolts question. So, so what I've done for this analysis when I'm using percentage figures is I've looked at the time period between um, March 15th and May 2nd, which is our last measurable period uh, in our weekly data, which is the the data that comes to us most frequently, and compared it to the same time periods a year prior. So I'm not looking at week over week change. I'm looking at these weeks versus the same weeks a year prior. Thank you. Uh, and then we've got a lot of uh, kind of specific category and sure. questions here. Uh, someone asks, as your research causes you to dive deeper into consumer purchases and analyze their behavior, what conclusion can you make about consumers with regards to apparel marketed as sustainable? Sustainable apparel how are we doing on that well I, I can i i really have no answer about you know what's happening in that in that world right now i can say that in aggregate when i've sliced and diced whether it's footwear or apparel um what i tend to see is that the um the closure of brick and mortar has affected everyone the same Every category roughly, you know, has taken roughly the same level of hit. There are some small footwear categories um, that have done better than others. Same thing with apparel, for example. You know, the, you know, again, I feel like master of the obvious. Um, the sleepwear is only down nine percent, right? So, you know, there are <laughs> categories in in which you know we have seen um, some strength, but by and large, when it comes to um, success or failure within these big aggregated categories, I, I really don't, I don't really have a lot to offer. Um, I can say in terms of deeper analysis of the equipment categories, I have seen a general trend towards um, less performance oriented price bands, you know? So um, what I would do is certainly ask that question, which is, you know, are, is the item in question in a value price band? Is it something that has a value price point? And that makes natural sense as people, I think, want to spend money on things they will use, but they want to make sure that they're being smart about the spend. And so they're a little more conscious, I think, about the price point of an item than they might have been three, four months ago. Sure. So in a certain way, sustainability, those kind of things are, are, are a bit on hold now, right? I mean, we're seeing that even with plastic bottle use, right? Where people were, there was a lot of acti activity around not using plastic, uh, uh, you know, single use plastics. Um, and, and all that stuff's kind of gone on hold a little bit now, right? As people are looking for price or other options. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I was talking to a coworker this morning and, you know, uh, bottles like, uh, you know, just the, like brand name bottles that are, you know, made out of metal or, or sustainable products. Um, you know, glassware, metal, those types of things. We do track that here uh, at MPD across a range of our services. But within sports, those those sales are down about 75 percent, 
right, between thermal insulated containers and and bottles. And I think, you know, part of the challenge is, is that if the cons if the item isn't in front and center of the consumer, it's hard for them to remember to act, you know, act sustainably, right? So they're, you know, at home, they're not thinking actively, I've got to get online and buy the item. And as a matter of fact, they've got cupboards full of glassware and, and coffee cups and that kind of stuff. So I think, you know, the the need has been diminished because people aren't traveling to and from their offices or home or outdoors. And until those behaviors kind of re-emerge or people even going back to school like Visco Girls, um, those types of sales are going to be kind of a little bit restrained uh, until we, we pick up some momentum in terms of people traveling back and forth. Um, so, you know, and they, in, in fact, some of those items are totems, right? So whether that's sustainable apparel or uh, drinkware, you name it, unless you have a place to show them off, you're probably going to wear, you know, the T-shirt you woke, woke up in or, or the sleepwear or whatever and just tootle around the house until you're, uh, yeah, a great T-shirt, by the way, David. Um, so, you know, I think that's kind of where we're at, right? So I think that's kind of um, kind of the nature of, of where we're at in retail right now. Absolutely. Uh, and that was just what someone wanted to know about that personal hydration category was already a question we had. Uh, another kind of uh, nut and bolts one here. Are you able to break data down between large uh, specialty chains versus smaller mom and pops? And has the size of a retailer affected or, or had a ratio to the damage caused by COVID? Yeah, um, you know, the probably the best data that we have right now that is just ongoing and we can monitor weekly is coming from our checkout tracking services. Um, you know, what we've seen here is, is like your large merchants um, have done very, you know, have done pretty well, fared well. They've been deemed essential services. They've largely stayed open. Their basket sizes have increased but we're seeing like department store, um, we have a measure, basically it's an index that's based on receipts. Um, it's a good proxy for traffic. Um, you know, department store traffic, brick and mortar is down almost 60%, 59%. Specialty footwear is down about 50%. And this is as of March or May 16th, right? To pre-COVID standards. Apparel is almost down, specialty apparel, right? Like, so this is inclusive of... Um, you know, your mom and pop specialty apparel store to, you know, just retailers that are specific to apparel um, down almost 90%, right? Um, and sporting goods is down 20%. There's a couple of reasons there where sporting goods, brick and mortar transactions have stayed up. One is, you know, the ability to, you know, buy online, pick up in store, like how we measure that is kind of propping up the number a little bit. Uh, secondly, a lot of uh, bike shops specifically and some uh, outdoor retailers were deemed essential because they're carrying goods um, that, you know, required servicing or, you know, were really hard for state uh, agencies to close down, you know, because they're carrying guns, ammunition, that kind of stuff, and or it was, you know, servicing bicycles. So, the, you know, the, that's kind of how I've been measuring the impact of this in terms of store traffic. Um, I don't know if that really answers the question, but if you think about those kind of categories of retailers, that's kind of what we're seeing right now. Sure. Uh, you know, talking about bike stores, I think there's a good question we have here too. Um, you know, obviously bikes are up and bike stores have been, in general, I know here in our state of Colorado, they've been uh, open during this. So are bike accessories and apparel sales up as much as hard goods bike sales? The short answer is no. Um, so apparel is down uh, in the bike arena, mostly because, again, I think there's this need to try it on before you purchase it. Accessories, um, you know, a lot of the bigger accessory categories in cycling are commuter related. So you have to ride someplace to use the accessory, for example, um, bike locks, right? Like it doesn't make a sense, a lot of sense to buy a bike lock if you're riding around your neighborhood and you're not going point to point. One of the accessories that is worth mentioning, again, going back to the health and fitness category is something like uh, bicycle trainers, right? So um, they're the, 
um, the doohickey or the technology that somebody can take their standard road bike or, or bicycle that they have at home mounted onto um, this trainer and be able to basically ride, it transforms that bike into indoor trainers. That Those numbers are up well over 200%. So there are pockets of success in accessories, um, but by and large was really driven the growth out of cycling uh, and bike shops has been the purchase of those lifestyle bicycles, transit fitness bicycles, so that people can be riding around their neighborhoods. Absolutely. Um, and, and moving into another category, one that you knew well, we have two questions here. I'm trying to synthesize them together. Uh, whoop, we just lost it. Uh, I'm sorry about this. Uh, yeah, some of the kayaks were on the positive side. What type of increase do you see in kayaks? And someone else wanted to know about paddleboard industry sales, kayak new stuff. So uh, kayaks are positive. Why yeah. and, and what specifically are you seeing there? Yeah. Yeah, so boats themselves are up about, you know, the boat category, which is inclusive of stand-up paddle boards, uh, inflatables, that kind of stuff. Are all, it's up about 35% um, in that measured period that I talked about. Kayak category or the boating category inclusive of accessories like personal flotation devices, paddles, is actually down a little bit. Um, so why is that? You know, I think what's happening is now – that that you know that first wave of emergency purchases happened you know in that you know second week you know the ending maybe march 21st 22nd right there don't quote me exactly on the weekend date but you know that first or second week of the crisis you know once that need subsided i think people started to think about activities that uh, could keep them busy and healthy outdoors and and uh, socially distanced so the same kind of behavior that I think has driven people to think about cycling is also driving people to think about kayaking. You know, it's something that you can purchase, get out on a lake, um, you're essentially alone, you're away from people, and you're enjoying, you know, that, that breath of fresh air that I mentioned early on about hammocks, right? Like, just getting that moment to uh, enjoy uh, not the four walls of your home uh, I think is inviting people into these activities. So I think that's kind of the underlying reason for kayaks to, you know, emerge positively. Um, I think in terms of recreational kayaks, as well as some of these other categories, think about which, you know, what retailers are carrying those items in the early spring uh, for, you know, mass purchase. Um, and kayaks is often, you know, seen at larger format retailers. So, you know, an available option for consumers to think about. And we have more questions too, to continue with hard goods. Uh, this is one that people it might not be buying now necessarily, but looking forward, we have some questions about the ski and snowboard industry, whether, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you have any ideas looking forward to the fall and also about ski touring right now doing well, and will that be continuing into the fall? Yeah, I really would withhold my comments so we don't have enough real, I think, data about what the fall is going to look like to be able to predict those types of things. I can tell you that, you know, looking at the March data as it still stood alone with ski resorts closing and so forth, um, you know, it's pretty clear how symbiotic sales are to uh, resorts operating. So, you know. Uh, again, being a master of the obvious, we want to be tracking, you know, the uh, the openness of ski resorts as we move into the fall of this year. Cool. Uh, what about we have a question here about uh, two questions actually on on the same thing on geographic trends. Do you see mm -hmm. any different in different parts of the country or unique purchases in different parts of the country? You know, I really haven't dug into the detail uh, geographically. Um, we do have uh, on the um, checkout tracking side in aggregate, we are capable of looking at store openings by state and DMA. And, you know, you can see very predictably the pattern of, of openness um, based on, uh, you know, state level mandates. I don't have anything categorically I can really talk to you about when it comes to um, individual categories and how they're performing in, in different regions. Um, well, here's a more a deeper dive 
question that might rely a little less on numbers and more on, on your experience and, and instincts here. Someone wants to know how do we keep those new consumers who have found the outdoors for the first time because of this crisis engaged? Is it lower prices? Is it less technical gear? Is it very distribution? Uh, mm -hmm. it is an opportunity, right? But how do we? How do you think we can take advantage of it? Yeah, you know, I think it, it comes down to looking at these pockets, you know, of where we've seen growth. So we've seen growth in consumers trying to reinvent recess, right? Like how do they keep their kids engaged, active and outdoor? Um, that's a durable desire, I think, for consumers and tapping into that with our marketing messages uh, as an outdoor equipment industry or an outdoor industry is going to be really, really critical. Um, secondly, you know, this backyard adventure, you know, people are showing a propensity to want to breathe fresh air. Um, again, how do you make that approachable? And then finally, uh, you know, this healthy home kind of um, focus. Um, we touched on this earlier, Doug, that, you know, how do we make, make that moment last? And I think in all three cases, it's really about messaging. And if we're proactive about how we talk about these activities, um, it'll only benefit what we're trying to do. So I think a lot about um, the emergence of um, station, I think a lot about stationary biking probably too much because I'm on one a lot um, during the crisis. And, you know, um, it wasn't too long ago that all you do is stare at a blank wall and get really, really bored, right? Um, there has been a recent emergence in the technology to allow you to ride with other people virtually. And I think that connectedness is an underlying theme that we need to think about as we're developing our marketing messages and thinking about our brands and the durability of outdoor activities. It's, you know, how do you um, make sure that people understand that this is a healthy activity that benefits people? Um, and as long as we stay on that message, I think we, you know, I don't, I don't pretend that it's a magic solve and it's going to solve everything for us. Um, but I do think it's probably something that we, um, as an industry, if we, we choose to ignore it, um, it's probably worse, uh, a probably worse off bet than, you know, embracing that and leaning into it as, kind of a fundamental element of why do people want to engage with our equipment, with our retailers around those three themes, right? So they can go elsewhere and get the same satisfaction. But I think we come, we, we tend to be seen as kind of legit, right? So that's kind of where I would, would kind of answer that question is really examine our messages to the market. Um, I'm not so sure it's about pricing. I'm not so sure it's about any of those other elements um, as as much as it's about being authentic to our community and uh, authentic to the consumers as to why we do what we do and why people should come to us. Sure. Um, and I think this leads on to another question. It's something interesting. I, I think we're start talking a little bit more about how much of this behavior you know, is just ways people are adopting to deal with the crisis and how much of it is actually going to stick. Uh, mm -hmm. This next question it makes me think about what I've been doing, which is, you know, with the orders and all that. And luckily enough, where we live here in Boulder is me and my family have done all these uh, adventures right from the door. And as I said, we're right. lucky we have great stuff to do from the door. Uh, this next issue of the weekly, we've got some photographs from Liam Doran, who lives in Breckenridge, and he's going out from his door and shooting shots for powder, you know, getting mountain biking, and traveling shots, that's great. So that kind of leads into this question uh, someone had here, which was pretty long too. They were saying how uh, you used to hear done in a day is a big thing, and then millennials were hyper-localized. Uh, and this person is wondering, do you now see a trend of people wanting to keep their activities as close as possible, as in done from the doorstep? And will this kind of done from the doorstep idea continue? Will people keep doing that? Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I can't get in the business of predicting what people will do. Um, I, you know, I can certainly talk about ways that we can potentially keep them doing what they're doing. We do see a high propensity within the categories that are being purchased kind of better than they were last year of, you know, consumption of stuff that they can use in their back door, out of their back door, you know, literally 
grills are up, hammocks are up, rec tents uh, over the last couple of weeks have really, um, really done well. And I, you know, I, I think people are trying to embrace how do we easily get outdoors. And, and so the question then becomes, you know, how do you keep that behavior up? And again, it comes back to messaging. And this is the, you know, where the vitality of the specialty retailer may really be beneficial because we, you know, specialty retailers create local communities and there's probably one of no better places for people to understand how to find that backyard experience or out the back door experience than talking to that specialty retailer. So I, I certainly would lean into that opportunity to kind of continue or foster the behavior. Um, you know, that's just kind of my kind of back a napkin way of thinking about this is like, what's doing well and how do we keep it going? Sure. And that leads into one of these, these other questions I'm seeing here is someone wants to know, you know, who's really gaining market share now and of those people gaining market share, you know, which ones do you see is really sticking, which we've covered mm -hmm. somewhat. Yeah, anymore. yeah. I mean, you know, we know uh, basically categories uh, early on that were emergency related gained, you know, short term share. Now we're seeing again, I think these three themes categorically are the themes or are, are areas in which we're seeing share gains. Um, if you're looking for brand information, I certainly would reach out to, you know, NPD and, and talk to account managers or business development folks and and uh, lean into that and find out what it would take to understand who's winning and losing at the brand or item level. Um, that's something that, uh, you know, I will reserve comment on uh, as part of this, as part of kind of what we do for a living. So mm -hmm. uh, I'll just I'll just kind of withhold that. <laughs> um, I think we're also seeing a lot of uh, questions to just to synthesize a lot of questions here about manufacturing. Someone's right. saying, you know, bikes right now, you know, bikes are doing great, but you can't get them. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we've got a lot of manufacturing going on overseas. You know, we have a lot of new, a lot of the new products that were supposed to be out at outdoor retail aren't even out yet. Uh, do you have any insight or predictions on how, uh, you know, what's going on now is going to affect manufacturing and stuff coming into the future? Gosh, I really don't. I mean, um, you know, we see the demand side of the business really, really well at NPD, right? We see the transactions at POS. We see those types of things. But by and large, we don't um, we don't see a heck of a lot of inventory information through the supply chain. So it's really, really hard to predict. What I can say is, you know, if tradition holds, um, most of this equipment is um, shipped uh, via sea, and that takes some time. Um, so that's something I think we all have to think about and factor in is, is just the amount of time it takes for um, our manufacturing community to react to a trend. Um, you know, the, we don't, we're not in the business like of technology or iPhones where we can uh, afford necessarily to um, transport these things via air. So um, that's, I don't really have any answers, but those are the things that I'd be looking at is, is how quickly can we react uh, as a community of manufacturers and retailers to these trends, um, given kind of what we know about our present supply chain. Uh, we have a lot of questions here too about, uh, you know, surprise categories, anything that, that's coming up big that you hadn't heard of before that this industry might not have heard before. Uh, people want to know whether backyard games are doing well, whether the backyard camping is yeah. going to bring in more sleeping bags yeah. and things like that. Um, yeah. Is there anything that outdoor retailers and manufacturers should pay attention to that they wouldn't normally? Do? That's a great question. Uh, Doug, uh, I don't know if you get to peer into the backyards of, of Boulderites. Uh, I live just up the street from you and I am flat out astonished by the number of uh, trampolines that have been erected in the neighborhoods of Colorado. Um, I talked to um, uh, the, the industry advisor in our toys practice, and she shared with me that um, year to date, so I'm changing my time periods a little bit, but from January to, to April, uh, backyard toys, you know, things like trampolines, scooters, playground equipment, 
those are all up 35%, right? And you can only imagine that probably most of that has happened in March and April as the snow kind of melted off of uh, the landscape of America. So, yeah, I think, you know, looking to our toys category um, is probably a worthwhile um, endeavor. If you go to npd.com, um, we have a blog section, and I know Julie, the person I just mentioned, had written has just recently written um, a blog about what she's being seen, what she's seen in outdoor toys. So, uh, encourage you to visit that. Um, what can you learn from it? What are you know categories that we should think about? Um, anything, any category in which uh, somebody can play with it, use it for a little while in their backyard, seems to be doing pretty well. Even if you know you, your full intention is to take that uh, up into the mountains or on your you know camping vacation or whatever, um, those multi-use categories or multi-location items seem to be doing well. Whether that's a grill or a recreational tent, so I'd be looking at those, and I would be looking at your present categories and figuring out how to message them and market them so people know that um, they have that multi-purpose use. Absolutely. I know for me, um, you know, my big game plan uh, is, as as uh, uh, you know, frankly, I'm getting a bit tired of being locked in the house. Um, I love my family, I love my child, but uh, I really am looking forward a lot to putting a recreational tent in our our backyard and basically saying, you know, just check in a couple times a day. But why don't you go out? out there for a while, right? So I think embracing those types of uh, um, kind of personal desires uh, is probably gonna lead you to some good choices. So a man cave, a personal man cave is what we're looking for, right? But for kids, <laughs> <laughs> you know, no, no. yeah. <laughs> Um, we've got a, a couple of good online questions here too, or, or online retail. Uh, you know, the first one is, this, and I'll put them together for you. Uh, the first sure. one is, as sales have moved online, which online retailers have done better and which less so? And the other is, as sales have moved online, purchasing uh, average ticket prices per category, is it up or down versus brick or mortar? So are people spending more online and who's doing well with it? Yeah, so um, I can say yes, that they are spending more online, right? Like our transaction counts for online retailers are, are very, very high. Um, I prefer not to kind of uh, give you a bad number, so please reach out to me, whoever that is. Um, I'm at Dirk, D-I-R-K dot Sorensen at NPD.com, and I can give you a little bit more detail there. Um, in terms of how our data works, we tend to um, assure the confidence of the retailers that report to us through POS. Um, so we really can't commit to or comment on any, any individual retailer performance because of point of sale. Uh, our checkout tracking services, we can kind of unravel that a little bit better for you and happy to talk with anybody about that opportunity uh, offline. A little bit sensitive. Sure, absolutely. Um, another two questions I can kind of combine here for you as we're getting closer to the hour. Uh, sure. People want to know both whether uh, there's going to be a bigger movement to shop local, and they're wondering how the the made in the USA whether that's doing doing well or not any effect on what we're seeing. So shop local, made in the USA. How are those playing out? Yeah, I don't I don't have any data points to really uh, lay my uh, you know kind of lay my answer on. So so again, I'll kind of restrain my my commentary i certainly would uh encourage that questioner uh to look at consumer survey work that's being done and published um in periodicals um there is a company uh called civic science that does a pretty darn good job at getting kind of a finger on the pulse of trends like that like what are what are Americans' attitudes towards other countries and products from other countries, that kind of stuff. So you may want to look there. Absolutely. Um, and then we have a host of questions here uh, about hiking and backpacking and, and camping equipment. I think a lot of people are, yeah. are wondering about that. They're wanting to see if there's any, you know, 
rising tide for people with the backyard campaign. They want to know uh, yep. what these are going to look like into the future. Yeah. Uh, what it's going to look like for development. So a lot of people are really interested in camping, hiking, backpacking. Yeah, yeah. So um, probably not surprisingly, we haven't really seen any breakouts, uh, you know, where we've seen the trend turn positive in those categories yet, uh, you know, like in terms of year over year performance. What we are seeing is, is that the trend line in general across almost all sports equipment, outdoor equipment specifically, is generally going up since kind of early, well, to late to mid-March, right? So it really bottomed out, you know, right after the COVID crisis began, and we're starting to see a slow reemergence. But we're in aggregate, we're not seeing um, any breakout categories in what I would consider kind of technical outdoor yet. Um, that isn't to say it won't happen. It just hasn't happened yet. And I think part of it is um, people want to buy it when they can use it. And you've got kind of two depressing factors here. And by depressing, I'm talking numerical, not emotional. Um, you know, one is weather. You know, when does it change in each community to kind of engage people in getting outdoors? Um, two is the stay-at-home orders as they relax and let people – um, you know, enjoy the outdoors. So, Doug, um, you know, you mentioned you live in Boulder. It wasn't until just yesterday that Rocky Mountain National Park reopened, right? So when those uh, activity centers start to reopen, my expectation is, is that all that'll increase that demand. It's just it, only time is going to tell, but I think we have to look for um, those leading indicators before we can kind of say where, where are things going to go. <clears throat> and then finally, um, some of the technical categories, well, there's two more things to think about. Some of those technical categories really rely on gyms. So, for example, rock climbing. Um, we know that some of the rock climbing activity, climbing activities, is enabled by gyms until those open. We have to wait a little bit. And then finally, um, you know, I'd certainly be thinking about uh, the economy generally, the health of the economy generally, to allow people to buy technical equipment. Um, the basis of my answer there is is that, you know, we saw um, in the cycling side, we certainly didn't see any depression in, um, you know, technical bikes being bought, like higher-end bikes, but we didn't see the growth as quickly as we did and, you know, more value-based pricing. So those are all kind of four kind of interdependent things I'd be looking at and thinking about. Um, and that's what I do kind of personally for my, you know, fun time, um, just to try to, to see if I can bet right or guess right. Uh, but uh, it's only time will tell. But sure. in general, we're seeing, we're seeing some positive indications, cer certainly. But, you know, it could, it could look like this for a while. So, you know, just because we're doing this doesn't mean we're not going to see uh, again, you know, a, a little, a little bit of a depressing uh, behavior later in the summer. Sure. And, and someone also wanted to know, kind of to follow up on a little bit, whether you have any specific data on the high end, you know, on high end tents and backpacks and that kind of equipment. We absolutely do. Uh, again, I'd encourage you to call us and, you know, we can, we can suss that out a couple ways. Uh, either that's a category that we track that's just a standalone category within our data, or we have the ability at NPD to cut our data by price points. So, you know, somebody that has that specific question can reach out to me or our team and, and ask that question um, pretty specifically. And uh, go back to one more nuts and I'm just gonna hammer your questions here. We're coming near the hour. We're gonna go a little bit over three o'clock since there are so many questions. I don't yeah, wanna go too but yeah. Um, Going back here, someone said your data goes to May 2nd. They want to know if you have any insight on the Memorial Day weekend, time leading up to Memorial Day weekend anymore. We're going to have to wait for that. Really, you know, we don't have that data uh, in our hands yet. We probably won't have it for another two weeks, um, you know, another week, week and a half. But we're, we're going to start having that information in our fingertips over the next two weeks, whether that's from checkout tracking or um, – or our POS tracking services. So, um, you know, call us in a week. We'll, we, we can give you some some general indications of where it's gone. 
And uh, here we have a nice, very sardonic question. Uh, someone wants to know, how do you prepare for the second wave coming in the fall? Um, I, well, me, or, uh, uh, I, I don't have an answer to that because I, I don't know if I'm just being willfully ignorant about it or I just don't really want to go there, right? So I, I do think, um, you know, these durable trends that I've mentioned, you know, one of those three is reinventing recess. Um, I certainly would be leaning into that. I would certainly be thinking about um, is it either – uh, is demand either going to be driven because consumers have to react to a second wave, which we don't know will or won't happen, or um, is it just something that they, they've they realized during this crisis is a better kind of home moment for their kids, right? Like, you know, we, we talked early on about this, Doug, about, um, you know, kids riding bikes, you know, Um I'm gray haired and I prefer to think it's blonde, but everybody's fully told me that it's gray. Um, I remember being able to ride around my neighborhood, you know, and that that was part of my childhood experience. And I, and I'm not so uncertain in talking to a number of people that that kind of underlying emotional connection to some of the activities that we support, whether that's that tent in the backyard or, or a bicycle isn't something that, that parents aren't going to, haven't realized, but now do that they want to give to their children. Sure. Um, and, you know, I think that's an exciting opportunity for us, um, you know, way more. And this is me talking, this has nothing to do with NPD other than, you know, me kind of being willfully in love with the outdoor experience. Um, it's a gift that, um, you know, we can give uh, to people and, this is a time, I think, for us all to reflect on what that means and what it means for kids and what it means for ourselves. Um, it's a pretty moment. It's a pretty interesting moment, you know, uh, to come out of this crisis. And it's one that I think about a lot as a, as a human. Um, um, you know, this is me waxing poetic and, and I'm going to just do it. Uh, whitewater kayaking is something that is in my blood. It has fully transformed the person that I was and the person that I am. And uh, this is a great time now, I think, to think about those moments. Absolutely. Well, I think that uh, we got a lot of questions here. Two kind of questions. Question we can uh, add at the end here uh, and, and talk about how people can do more than this. Someone says, call me and pay for that info. Great marketing piece. <laughs> <laughs> but hopefully, hopefully we've dug more uh, you know hopefully we've covered as much as we can while we can still keep you guys in there sure and someone also wants to know how can especially retailer get more involved with npd to learn more and as you say that i'm going to put your slide up on the screen so people yeah can have that information there a little bit yeah. so tell us more about how they can they can pay you guys for more information Absolutely. Um, first, you know, uh, give me a call or e email me at dirk.sorensen at mpd.com about this conversation. Um, if you are a retailer specialty or not, um, and really want our, our uh, ability to, to help your business specifically, we offer a kind of an in-kind service. Um, by joining our panel, we can get you brand and item level information and lots of support. Uh, john.graph at npd.com or ed.ray at npd.com and help you out with that. And then if you are uh, really driven to get brand and item level information, uh, certainly contact julia.day at npd.com. But in terms of kind of the general category insights and so forth, if you want to, you know, shoot me an email, feel free to do that. You know, as long as we're not diving into item level information um, or brand level information, you know, we, we can typically, uh, you know, have a general conversation about some of those things. Sure, so we encourage really you to contact us. I mean, you guys really do give up a lot for free when it comes we, down to it. But. Yeah, we try to. I think, uh, you know, our team by and large cares about the industry and 
um, you know, to the to the person we really want to see everyone succeed and uh, and emerge from this crisis and really in general uh, be successful at retail and manufacturing. So we're happy to you know do what we can um, as we can do it. Fantastic. Well, I hope everyone got the information. Uh, they can contact us too if they want to know better ways yep. to contact you. Uh, it was a great conversation. We had a lot of people here, which was fantastic. Yep. Um, I really enjoyed talking to you. And uh, be here next week. We're going to talk to the folks at uh, Leave No Trace, uh, who just re released some uh, research as well about uh, public land and safety when people come back to that. So maybe you'll be able to, to send some questions into that one, Dirk, next time. <laughs> I will certainly try to. In the meantime, uh, everybody, I hope you stay healthy and uh, start getting outside and enjoy, uh, enjoy outdoor activities. Absolutely. Well, thank you. And thanks everyone for being here. Bye. Thank you guys.